year. Isn't it great to vuka from the old year to the new one? Yeah, the Lord will guard the feet of the saints. So we are not going to suffer. He will guard the feet of the saints in the new year. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'll ask her to read from the New International Version uh, in, the, in the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 54. Verse 2 and 3. As he said, Isaiah chapter 54, verse 2 and 3. I read, Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will possess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Amen. Praise Thank the you. Lord. Thank you very much. I'll allow you to sit. We have uh, indeed enjoyed ourselves during this holiday. As I mentioned to you, we... It was like a, a marriage anniversary because we got married uh, uh, 36 years, or actually 35 years ago in January. But since we did not celebrate our, our anniversary in January, it was very nice that we were able to come together. Normally I come alone and she comes alone when she comes to visit. But this was a great time. And we have had indeed a great time uh, with fellowship with some of you. Uh, it has been a blessed, blessed holiday. Uh, it's been long since uh, we had Christmas in Kenya which is actually different from Christmas in the, in the West. And uh, we had uh, uh, old memories of our childhood uh, renewed, and we, we, we really enjoyed ourselves. Um, uh, it's good to preach to a very young congregation. Most of the people are under 40. Uh, we, I was driving with the bishop and his son the other day, and we went to Marui. And I told the, the bishop's son, I used to pick coffee here, in Marurui, um, and he couldn't believe it. And, uh, but I thank God but uh, today I can buy enough coffee for myself. I don't need to pick any coffee. <laughs> uh, I want to speak to you. Um, let me first say that uh, thank you, Bishop, for allowing me to, giving him the honor to speak to this congregation the first Sunday of the year. This is a very important day because it's a, this is the opening of the year. And it's good that we pick something to move with, to run with. Uh, and as I was thinking what to share with you, um, uh, the Lord gave me the word to speak about the promise and the prayer. There's always a gap between the prayer and the promise. There's always a gap between the prayer and the answer. Many times, God gives the answer to your prayer. But... It is not the same as you possessing the answer. You possessing whatever blessing God is sending you. We read in the book of Daniel that he prayed and God answered immediately. And yet it took about three weeks before the answer could reach him because there was something hindering the answer. And you read the scriptures you find many times. God has indeed declared and decreed your blessing. God has indeed opened a door, as the bishop told us. There are doors that have been opened. But it is one thing to have a door opened, and it's another thing to walk through the door. Amen? It is one thing to be given a promise, and it's another thing to actually possess the promise. And we don't want just to have the promise out there. You want to be able to embrace the promise so that it can be beneficial to you and yours. So that it can be beneficial to you and those around you. And I thought I should speak about this gap. This gap between your prayer and the, uh, and the answer. The possession of what God has given you. Our prayer today and always is that God may enlarge us. I know that is your prayer. To be enlarged. To be given something to increase you. To make your life better. To move you from where you are to somewhere else where you think is a better place to be. So we are always praying to God to build us up. 
We are praying to God to enlarge us. And the second thing we are always praying to God is that he may protect us. Because you can be large. You can have a lot. But if you are under threat, if you are not protected, you will not enjoy it. You will not enjoy it. You can live in the best house. But if you awake, keep awake at night, because there are people who could come and come in and pick you out, you will not even remember and enjoy the beauty of the house. So we are always praying for God to enlarge us and to protect us. We find one man who prayed like that by the name of Jabez. He said, oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I'll be free from pain. And the verse, the, the verse ends with, and God granted his request. But today I want us to walk together with Jabez. He prayed, and God granted his request. I want us to speak and have a conversation with Jabez and ask him, from when you prayed and God granted your request, did he pick you up and drop you into a piece of land? Did he pick you up and drop you into a house? Or was there a process? What happened actually after that? And that is the gap we need to always, because that is what is keeping us from the blessings that God has for us. Whatever you've been praying for, God has indeed granted. The promises of God are yea and amen. And if you are a Christian, you have believed in Jesus Christ, the promises in this book are yours. So indeed, your prayer has been answered. Your request has been granted. The question is, how do we bridge the gap between our prayer and the promise that God has given us? The prayer of Jabez is based on one recognition. That unless the Lord builds the house, the builder works in vain. Unless the Lord watches over his city, the watchmen wake up but in vain. That is why he's saying, build me up, Lord. Enlarge me and protect me. And that is the basis of his prayer. That only the Lord can be able to build him and protect him. Why the Lord? It's because even as Jesus said, he, when he builds, the gates of hell cannot prevail. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You can put yourself in that verse and say, he will build my life, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against me. Are you not a member of the church of Christ? Are you not a part of the body of Christ? Then you can put yourself in that verse and say, he will build my life, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against me. He will build my family, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against my family. He will build my business, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This year I want you to declare, because the Bible says you shall declare a thing, and it shall be established. I want you to decree and agree with the word of God, that he will build my life, and the gates of hell shall not be able to prevail. Anything else that not build on the rock, the winds and the storms will come and will blow it off. But anything building on Christ, anything built by Christ, will be able to withstand the gates of hell. Amen? He will build my ministry. He will build my ministry. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's why you need not struggle. You just need to align yourself with God. You don't need to struggle. You don't have to wake up at night trying to figure things out. Align yourself on God and let God work for you. Let go and let God. Let go and let God. Let go and let God. Release yourself in freedom. Release yourself into rest and let God work for you. Amen? Amen. If he builds, the gates of hell shall not prevail. For those who are looking for work, for those who are looking for livelihood, I want you to decree and declare that he will build my livelihood and the gates of hell shall not be able to prevail. You see, the gates of hell represents every opposition, every form of evil you can imagine. That's what the gates of hell are. Anything that opposes you, anything that prevents you from going to where you need to be, these are the gates of hell. And the Lord is saying, I will build whatever it is that you want him to build. I will build and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what do I need to do? It is to align myself with the Lord. It is for me to join with him into his army so that he can be my captain and fight this battle for me. The battle is the Lord's. 
The battle is not mine. Jesus gave an example and said, there are two people who were building. One built on the rock, and the other one did not build. And he said, the rock is building on him, building in the kingdom of God. Those who will build their lives in the kingdom of God are building on the rock. Those who build outside the kingdom of God are building outside the rock. And Jesus gives an example and says, the winds and the storm came and hit the two houses. Don't think if you're in the Lord, our brother prayed, who prayed here before, he said, there will be challenges. It is, I thought he would say, it is going to be good and good. But he said, it's going to be good and there will be challenges. I thought, oh, what a word for, for January. He should have said, it will be good and good. But he, he, was, he was sober. He said, it's going to be good, but there will be challenges. The house that was built on rock was also hit by the storms. The house that was not built on rock was also hit by the storms. But which house stood? The one that was built on rock was built to stand the storm. Amen. And that's what the Lord wants to build us. I don't want to tell you that there will be no challenges. There will be challenges. But if you are built on the, law, on the Lord, if your house is built on the rock, then it will be able to withstand the storms of time. It will be able to withstand the storms of this life. It will be able to withstand the challenges of this year. And when you come to the end of the year, you'll be able to say, Ebenezer, the Lord has been with me. The Lord is the one who has brought me this far. You'll be able to say, my house was built by the Lord. Praise the Lord. Even if we're in the Lord, the storms will come. Many times when we face challenges, and sometimes we face huge, serious challenges, as I tell you, if you have never faced serious challenges, you haven't lived. But if you live long enough, you find there are some challenging times. If you are human, you will face challenges. And many times we ask ourselves, where is God? Why is he allowing this? And the Lord answers you, even as you face challenges this year. As you face very difficult times, and you wonder yourself, where is God? He answers you in Isaiah 43, verse 2 and 3, and says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Amen? You might be asking, where is he? But he says, I will be with you. He's not going to stop you going through the waters. But he will be with you. And if he's with you, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you will be able to survive whatever it is that you go through. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Amen? Because you will walk through the fire. I want to assure you. Rest assured that you will pass through some fire. The good thing is that, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you will come and people will wonder, how come you are able to go through this? And you will say, there was a fourth man. We were three when we started. But in the fire, we found there was a fourth man who was preventing the fire from burning me. Unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers work in vain. Unless the Lord watches over his city, the watchmen wake up, but in vain. But if we are built on a rock, our lives shall be able to stand. And when you are above 50, you will be able to say, Ebenezer, this far it is the Lord who has built me. This far it is the Lord who has brought me. And we give, we, we encourage those so young to tell them that it is good to be in the Lord because your house will be built. You will come from picking coffee to have enough to buy your own enough coffee. Amen? Amen. Amen. The Lord is able to build. Amen? Amen? So sometimes we ask, where is God? But he's always there with us. I'm saying this because in a congregation like this, I can assure you fear people facing very major challenges. Under the law of mathematics and probability, you can be sure there are people who will be facing different issues. And I want to encourage that one, I don't know to whom I'm speaking, that when you feel like God has left you, remember he's with you. I said I wanted to speak about the gap that exists between your prayer and your answer. I want to give you two stories, one in the New Testament and one in the Old Testament, which will illustrate how sometimes we stay between, there is a gap and a bridge between our answer and our prayer. 
God has given us the answer and yet we are not able to possess it and to embrace it. Because I want to assure you that all of you, God wants to bless you. The scripture is clear that he has decreed that those who are in the covenant, I will bless you. And blessing, I will bless you indeed. That's what the Lord is saying today. So I want to tell you that where you stand, it is not God who needs to change. Please remember this. God is like the North Star. God is constant. In the book of Exodus, or Genesis chapter 33, I believe I'm quoting from the right uh, book. We read a story of where the, uh, God is talking to the children of Israel. And he tells them, I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Pisites, Hemites, Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you. Because you are a stiff naked people, and I might destroy you on the way. Imagine God telling you like that. That's scary, isn't it? But there is a silver lining in the statement. Because he's saying, I will not take away the blessing, I mean, the promise. But he just says, I will not go with you. It's like you have a child, you're not going to neglect him and not feed him. But there are a lot of blessings and treasure you keep, which you're not going to release to him. He's saying, I will allow you to go into the promised land, but I will not be with you. I have three children. And I deal with them most, most similar maybe to the, say, the way the, the Bible is saying. I will not let, let them go hungry. But there's still treasure which I could release to them if only they shaped up. If only they behaved themselves. If only they stopped being stiff, necked. So, that's my first struggle. If you are stiff necked, maybe there are some blessings that you are keeping away from self. So you see, it's not God who needs to change. Amen? God is like the North Star. He's constant. He has made his promise. It is this, the person who is stiff-necked who needs to, to soften his neck. The person who is stiff-necked needs to soften his neck to be, as the people in Western would say, flexi flexibility. You need to be flexible. You need to let your, your neck uh, be able to move as God moves. But the, the interesting thing here is that God did not take away the blessing from them. Because God is a God of covenant. He had said, to bless, I will bless you indeed. But I want to tell you, sometimes the blessing you have is not the indeed blessing. Because of your stiff neck. I don't know what, what characterizes what in your life that could be said to be a stiff neck. Only you and God know. What is it that makes you stubborn? What is, it, what, what is it in your life that makes you not receive the word of God and move with it and walk with it? What is it in your life that resists the word of God? What is it in you that criticizes when the word of God is being preached? A critical spirit, and a, a, an, a, 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 an attitude that wants to reject Only you would know. But I want to tell you that there's abundance. There's a blessing that God wants to give you. That is only being prevented, not by God, but by you and me. Because of our stiff nakedness. And stiff nakedness can come in different ways. But only you know what it is that could prevent God from working with you. But God is merciful and kind. And Moses pleaded with God. Moses pleaded with God, and God changed his mind. Because we read in, again in another, uh, as we continue the same book. So the Lord said to Moses, after Moses pleaded with him, I would also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace with my sight, and I know you by name. In that section which I did not read, the Bible says, Moses talked to God as a man talks to his friend. And he was able to debate with God. If you, you, you let these people go, although you're blessing them, what are people going to say? And God relented and said, I will do 
this thing you have spoken. Because Moses has, had said, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. As we sang, we are telling the Lord, we don't want to move from here unless you go with us. Unless the Lord goes with us, we are not going to leave this place. You need to have that attitude. Unless the Lord helps me and shows me what is preventing my blessing, I'm not going to move with me from this place. This is January. As you look forward and see what is ahead of you, pray and say, I'm not going to live here until you have shown me what it is that would prevent me from receiving my blessing. We see a man wrestle with God, Jacob. And although he's wrestling with God or the messenger of God, it is not the messenger who needed to be changed. It is Jacob. Jacob is saying, I will not let you go until you bless me. He wrestles with the message of God. He says, unless you bless me, I will not let you go. And we need to have that tenacity. We need to have that attitude where we, we stand and say, I will not live here until I hear you, Lord. And yet, I must disclose to you, it is not God who needs to change. It is me and you. Because even then, the angel of the Lord says, you don't even know your identity. You don't know yourself. You are Jacob. You have prevailed with God and with man. And he twists his hip to mark him for life. I don't know whether you're going to wait until God wrestles you to the ground like Paul. Are you going to wait until God wrestles you? Or are you going to hear his soft voice speaking to you? I would pray until, I would pray that I can hear God. And I will not wait until my hip is twisted. And until I'm told you are a child of God. And the promises of God are yours. By knowing your identity, you know your blessings. By knowing who you are, you know your blessings. But I will tell you, it is not God who needs to change. It is us. It is Jacob who, who had to be revealed, to whom it had to be revealed, what, who he was. It is Jacob who had to be marked for life by the message of God. I want to tell you that it is you and me that need to ask ourselves, where are we concerning the promises of God? In the key verse that we read in Isaiah 54, verse 2 and 3, the Bible tells us, enlarge the place of your tent. It is you and me that are being told to do something. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, because God indeed wants to bless you with an indeed blessing. Amen? Enlarge the place you attend. Who is going to enlarge? Me and you. Who is going to enlarge? God is asking you to prepare. God is asking me to prepare. God is asking me to prepare the containers. God is asking me to prepare the place where he is going to pour his blessings. As I said, God does not change. God is like the North Star. He is constant. But he's asking you to do something. And you look at verse 3, he says, For he's asking you because you shall be expanded to the right and to the left. That is the promise. Between the instruction to expand yourself and this promise that God is going to pour blessings which you cannot contain, there is a gap. Because there is something that you need to do. What is it? To enlarge the place of your tent. In modern language they say, you build capacity. Amen? Sometimes I hear the, the schools collect money and they take the teachers to Mombasa and they call it capacity building. Have you ever heard them say that? So they use some of their fund money for capacity building. They, 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 they want to make you a better teacher. 
What God is asking you is actually to build capacity. Because he's going to pour so much blessing that he's going to tear your nets. Like when Jesus blessed uh, Peter in the fishing boat, he blessed them so much that their nets were actually breaking. And God is telling you, enlarge the place of your tent. Because that is a gap. The gap is that me and you are not ready. Me and you are not ready to handle the things. We have seen many people actually in, the, in, the, in, in time, in our own time, people who actually get drowned by the blessings. They actually forget the blesser. They get drowned in the blessing. Sometimes we are not even ready to receive the blessing. We cannot even handle. It's too much for us. We get drowned by the dressing and we forget the one who has blessed us. Enlarge the place of your sin. Develop capacity. The call here is to prepare your capacity. Prepare yourself. Because God has indeed a, a, a vowed and a covenant. He has taken an oath. That blessing, I will bless you. If you are a child of God, if you have received Christ as your savior, the scripture tells us that the blessing of Abraham has come to you by faith. And any promise that God has given, you can put your name in it and claim it. So it is not God who needs to change. It is he and you that need to change. Even when we pray, the Bible says he already knows before you pray. So actually prayer, you might think you're telling God to do something, but it's actually yourself, you're preparing yourself. You're aligning yourself with God. It's not that the prayer is the one causing him to bless you. It's that you're only aligning yourself. You are agreeing with God. Amen? So don't say, oh, it's because I prayed very hard. It's because I prayed more than everybody else. You're just aligning yourself with God. God has indeed said he will bless you. He has already indeed said he will bless you. And he wants to bless you. So the call today is enlarge the place of your son. Prepare your capacity to receive because you will receive overflowing blessings. Amen? Amen. This is indeed the year of unmatched, or what was it? Uncommon. The general overseer has declared that this is the year of uncommon blessings. Amen? Uh, do you have the capacity? Do you have the capacity? Do you have the capacity to receive uncommon blessings? Can you handle blessings or they are going to drown you? The scripture says you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous in every occasion. Amen? That's the word you read on the, on the what? Where, where have you been reading the, this scripture? On the water, the water bottle. That's a scripture inscribed on your water bottle. The cathedral water bottle. You will be enriched. In every way. You will be enriched in every way. Because when we say God is going to bless you. Many people's mind jump to money. Quickly. But blessing, there are many things which money cannot buy. Which are more expensive than what money can buy. I have faced many problems where there's not enough money in a bag I can beat with. I don't have enough money to beat with. They are just beyond, even if I sold all my wealth and threw it in, it would not solve. Only God. That's why he says, I will enrich you in every way. In every way. In every way. So that you can be generous in every occasion. How much can you give for your health? There's not enough money in this world. There was a debate in the, in the United States where the, the people were challenging the president and said, when he came into power, he, his, main, his main agenda was to give health care to everybody in the country. There are many people who opposed him. And they said, no. Your first agenda should have been jobs, jobs, jobs. So you ask the people, which, which one do you want? Do you want a job or do you want health care? And I posed that question recently in our own church. We were discussing something else. I just gave us an example. And one person said, I want health care. There are other people who argue, give me a job. I'll take care of the rest. 
But, but sometimes there are things you cannot, you cannot pay with money. The call is to enlarge our tents because God is indeed wants you to bless us. There is no question that God wants to bless you. Amen? So do not worry that maybe or possibly indeed God wants to bless you. And God is no respect of persons. God wants to bless you and me. Whatever things you are praying today, whatever your desires and needs today, I want to tell you that God wants you to come and meet you at the point of your need. Not maybe, not possibly, but God indeed wants to meet you at the point of his need, your need. It is you actually who needs to prepare for that. Look at your own life and see what is hindering the blessing of God. I want to tell you that there are three things you will need to do to be able to bridge the gap between your prayer and the promise of God. One, you have to connect with the source. I believe many of you have connected with the source. You have connected with God. You are in his kingdom. You have accepted Christ as your savior and Lord. Because that is the very source. The Bible says there is only one mediator between man and God. Jesus Christ. There is only, only, only one mediator between man and God. If I'm going to tap into the kingdom of God, if I'm going to tap into the economy of God, then there is only one mediator between man and God. The man, Jesus Christ. And if I'm in Christ, I can put my name on every promise in the Bible. Amen? I can put my name in every promise in the Bible if I'm in Christ. I'm already in the kingdom of God. I can claim that blessing. You need to make the connection. If you are here and you have not made the connection with Christ, I want to encourage you. There are many people who are afraid. They think if I get saved, something bad is going to happen to me. I want to assure you, nothing bad is going to happen to you. I have never seen anybody who got worse or his life got worse by get, getting saved. Have you? I have never seen. If you know one, come and show me. Anybody whose life got worse by getting saved. I've never seen one. And if you know of any, please come show me. I'd like to meet him. A person whose life got worse because he got saved. So, we are saying make the connection. Make the connection into the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. For us who have made the connection let us know our place, our identity. Remember the story of the prodigal son. Remember his older brother. When his brother came back home, this story is marked in Luke chapter 15. When his younger brother who had gone and wasted his life came back home, and his father uh, made a party for him. He was mad. He was angry. He said, how can you waste more resources on these, as they call them, scumbag? These rog, these uh, good-for-nothing young men. I thought, I thought if my, my brother who had got, gotten lost in some place, I don't know, Uganda or Somalia, came back, and uh, my father wants to create a party. I thought I would join in the party, but this guy got mad. And uh, in the process of getting mad, he got confused. Because instead of celebrating, he filled his heart with bitterness. And the Bible says, his father asked him, all these things that are in the house, are that not yours? The Luo have a saying that a beast lives in the sugarcane plantation and it doesn't know that the sugarcane is sweet. This older brother lived with all the wealth and he did not even know that he was entitled. 
I mean, could it be that me and you actually are living with a, men, a poverty mentality? Are we living in a state where God has resources for us and we can't even see? We can't even know. We don't know that we are the children of the home and everything in the home is ours. I want to tell you that maybe like Zacchaeus, the tree that is going to help you see is next to you. These people you see here, these are your connectors. Do you see them? Maybe you are looking for other people someplace else. Maybe the other people you would like to be your friend. Somewhere else. But they are not. These are the people God has given you. These are the people who will connect you to wherever God wants to take you. You might be living in a sugarcane plantation and you don't know that the sugarcane is sweet. Because every person that God has brought you in contact, these are the people that God is going to use to take you wherever you want to go. There are people maybe you desire, maybe so and so should be my friend. And you have tried to greet him many times. But he's not responding. But there are people also who are trying to greet you and you are you are ignoring them. Those are the people. The people you are actually ignoring are the people who will help you to reach your destiny. These are the people that God has given you. Those others, somewhere else, in the blue. I don't know where. Those will not help me. It is you. It is the people. Maybe you are ignoring the person whom God has sent you to help you reach your destiny. Make the connection with the source. Know what is around you. Ask God to open your eyes to see the blessings in the kingdom of God and connect with those blessings. As I said, build the capacity to receive the blessing of God. The Bible says, you are, 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 are near, a person who has had an inheritance. If you are below the age of 18, if you are not mature, you are still a child. And your father dies and he is very wealthy. Your wealth will be kept by who? Trustees. You will not be able to enjoy your wealth. You will not be manage your, to manage your wealth. So sometimes our immaturity, our lack of capacity will keep us from building enough capacity to receive the blessing of God. The Bible is very clear. If you don't have capacity, God will only give you in, in drops. Like the way we give medicine, He gives you in drops. In Exodus chapter 23, verse 27 and 30, the Bible gives a story of how he allowed the children of Israel to inherit the land. He said he only allowed them to inherit slowly as they build up capacity to be able to manage the land. Amen? Go read for yourself. Exodus chapter 23. He only allowed them as they build capacity. So the blessing of God is not being withheld from you, but you do not have the capacity to receive it. As soon as you have the capacity, you'll be surprised. As soon as just like human beings, if I employ you, if I give you employment and I find you have capacity, I give you more work. And I give you more money. I give you more work and more money. As you build capacity. If I find, and I have found people, you give them work and they are not able to do it, you actually take some of the work away. Fortunately, you might not be able to reduce your salary. But you actually take the work away to somebody because work has to be done. As we build capacity, God is going to bless us. God is going to, to increase us. He's going to allow us to get into blessing. Jesus said in John 15 verse 7, the branch that has potential for production, he prunes. He prunes. You know, pruning, they use a very sharp knife. Isn't it? So, do you want to be pruned? So that you can be more productive? Do you want to build capacity? Those who grow fruit trees, they prune so that the tree can produce more fruit. But if the tree could talk to you, when they are using a sharp knife to remove a branch, it would say, oh, 
Because that's a sharp knife cutting off the branch that is causing, reducing the, the, the fruitfulness. You build capacity of a fruit tree by actually cutting off some things. Do you believe that? You'd, you'd think that you build the capacity of fruit tree by growing more branches. But sometimes you cut off the, some branches to build more capacity. What is it in your life? What is it in my life that might need to be cut? To be cut so that we can be more productive. I don't know what it is, but I want to tell you that God is willing to bring his blessings to your life. That God is willing to answer your prayer. But you have to be in that place where you are ready to receive, to contain, and to manage that which God is going to give you. Because God is an effective investor. God is an effective in, uh, uh, economist. He is not going to waste any of his resources. He is going to entrust it to people who are ready. He is going to entrust to people who can manage it. He is going to entrust people who can contain it. I told you about my own children. I am not going to, re to, to reveal the whole treasure. I am not going to open the whole treasure box until they shape up, until they straighten up, and until I am sure that they will be able to manage that resources. The second richest man in the world has said he will give half of his money to the poor. He has given his children a part, but he's not going to give them all to them. If my children don't shape up, what do you think is going to happen? Put yourself in that slot. Imagine God saying, if my children don't shape up, I'm going to give this, this uh, resources to some place else. He's saying, I have treasure, and I want to release it. But are you ready? Are you ready? Build capacity. Make the connection. Build the capacity. And most important, take possession. Because you can, you can pray all day long. I can put a gift ahead of you or in front of you. But until you get it, until you take possession, until you move into the land, the Bible says every step, everywhere you step with your feet, I will give you. God is calling you to make a move. Near my office, there's a place I walk. There's a, a road and there's a path on the side of the road. About one, one kilometer from the office to where it is, there's a guy who repairs vehicles on the side. He has a garage. And in an old window, there's something which was put on the window. I don't know whether it's to whatever for. And it says this. Go ahead. Start something. I, and I always pass there and I read that thing and I wonder, what a statement. Go ahead. Start something. We are in January. Go ahead. Start something. Take possession. Take possession. Make a move. Because it's when you move that you find that God is ordering your steps. In Matthew 7, 7, Jesus says, ask and it will be given you. Do you believe Jesus? Do you believe Jesus? Do you believe the words of Jesus? Are they marked in red in your Bible? In some of the Bibles, they are marked in red. Danger. Matthew 7, 7, never forget that verse. Never forget that verse. Underline that verse in your Bible. It's a doing verse. Ask, ask, ask. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Bishop said on the Kesha, there is an open door. Sometimes you can't see it. But he said, go on knocking doors. And finally you will find the door that will open for you. Amen? Amen. Keep on knocking. Keep on asking. And keep on seeking. Make the connection. Build the capacity and then make it a move. Take possession of the blessings of God. I, we had, I've had, a, I had a very uh, interesting conversation with a friend recently. He told me the month of November was very slow for business. 
Then, after a while, I met another friend. And the other friend told me that he had given work to the first friend and he had not done it. So, that, that to me sounded like a contradiction. He told in the month of July, uh, to me he was telling me, oh, the month of November was bad. But he had just been given some work by another friend and he hadn't done it. Or he couldn't even be found. There is always a gap between what you are praying for and what you want to embrace. There is an action required to take possession. Take possession. I don't know what it is. But maybe you've just been praying. But I want to tell you that God is telling you to move now. Start knocking doors. Start asking questions. The other day I was in a fellowship and... Uh, one of the young men who had saw me, who saw me like 20 years ago here, when he saw me, he started asking me questions. And he started asking me, if I want to do this, how do I do that? He, he seized the moment. I mean, he hadn't seen me for 20 years, but he was not afraid. He came quickly and started asking me questions, and we spent like 30 minutes talking. Keep on asking. We don't know what, what that conversation will lead. I don't know whether God was leading him to come that particular day. So that he can ask me the question he was asking me. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. Do you have a need? I want to encourage you that from tomorrow, go on and start knocking off his doors. Amen? Amen? Go on and start writing applications. Are you so tired? Have you sent like a hundred applications? Send one more. Keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. Keep on asking. Because if you knock, the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, he receives. And who seeks, finds. Make use of the connections that God has given you. Look around for the sugar king. God is always asking you, what is that in your hand? And that's why he wants to start. What is that in your hand? Start from where you are and see what God will do. He will take a rod, your walking rod, and he will drop it down and he will scare your enemies. Just you, you thought it a walking stick, but Kumbe, God can change it into a weapon. What is it you have in your hand? Oh, don't just say, oh, I just got a diploma. That's what you got. What do you have in your hands? What you have is what you have. And God will use what you have. Samson took a jaw of a donkey. And God used it as a weapon. And he was able to defeat an army. With a jaw of a donkey. God can take. It's not what you have. It is God putting power behind it. It is not what you got in your hands. It is God putting power in it. That will cause it to, to bring you where God wants to take you. As I conclude. I want to tell you even as you seek. And even as you ask. And even as you knock doors. Remember you are dealing with people. Amen. Wherever you knock you are going to find people. Whatever you ask you are asking people. Whatever you are seeking you are seeking people. It is people you are going to connect with. And I want to give you five A's which you need to carry with you as you knock, as you seek, and as you ask. The first A is be available. Be available. Allocate quality time to whatever goals you have. We know, we know what is important to you by how much time you have allocated to it. Don't tell me this is important to me if you haven't allocated any time to it. Be available. There are people who have no work, who have no employment, and they are not available. I've actually given some work to a young man, and it's as though he was wishing the work would get quickly, fast enough so that he can go back to his computer games. This person is not available. Because next time I will try 
maybe to find somebody else. Because he's like, I'm disturbing him from his computer games. I'm giving, he has no work, but I'm giving him work. Uh, but, so that person is not available. That's the first A. Be accessible. You see, being available and being accessible is not the same thing. If you are Mteja all the time, even if I'm calling you for work, are you going to, to, know, to, know, to hear it? Unless, let me tell you, unless you're in a meeting or there's a good reason, don't switch off your phone. Maybe someone else has told you you should switch off your phone. But unless you have a good reason, don't switch off your phone. People who call you are not calling you to disturb you. These are the resources that God is sending you. Or there are people actually calling so that you can give them ministry. If you say you are a minister and you are closing your phone, are you serious? Unless there is a reason, of course, if you are praying or maybe you, if you are, when you are in, in, in bed certain hours, uh, or there, is a, a good, there should be a good reason why you switch off your phone. But you can't just switch people off. I don't switch my phone off. Unless there's a very good reason. Be accessible. You miss many opportunities. Some people appear too busy. I have, I have a friend. He doesn't have enough work. But when you're talking to the phone, you are the one who called him, but he wants to cut you off. Have, do you have people like that? You are, you are the one who called. He doesn't let you finish the conversation. People who are busy, but it's not true business. It's an attitude. It's an air. It's a problem. Be accessible. If you are going to connect with what God, the blessing that God wants to do, you are, God is going to use people. Don't be mistaken. God is going to bring you to your blessing through people. And the third A, be approachable. My son used to tell me that I'm stone-faced. <laughs> so, and actually he helped me. Because maybe I smile more from that time than before. Don't be too serious. Unless, as the bishop would say, the heavens and the earth are going to meet. <laughs> Don't be too serious. Take it easy. Take it easy. Take it easy. It will improve the face value, your face value. I'm doing it much more these days because as you grow older, the more you look serious, the more you have creases. <laughs> you, you get angry, uh, you get, uh, what do you call it? Uglier by the day. The more you appear serious. Like you have some very serious issues you're considering and, and working on. Be approachable. If, if, if people are going to help you, you, you can't be a person who passes people. You, you should always greet people, even people you don't know. My wife has, if he came to a, a people he doesn't know, before long you have made two or three friends, before I have even greeted one person. <laughs> he will talk to them as though they have always been together. And who knows, you might receive angels and be known to you. How do you know who God will send to you? Be approachable. I was talking to Boaz. And uh, from his reading and my reading, we came to a conclusion that what is called emotional intelligence is more important than your IQ. I want to go, you go and read yourself and see whether you agree with me and Boaz. Our, our people used to call it intelligence you are born with. But I want to disagree, it is not intelligence you are born with. It is intelligence you develop. These skills I'm talking about, you actually develop them. I, my son just told me you are stone-faced. And he actually educated me immediately. 
It's, there are things, if you know already you have an, an attitude, if you have something which hinders people from approaching you, if you know there is something that makes you unpleasant to be with people, take care of it. Even if it's bad breath. I mean, whatever makes it uncomfortable for people to be with you, that is actually hindering you from going wherever you're going. Because it's through people that you're going to go where you're going. And last but not least, oh no, that, is, that was, I told you five, eh? I've given you four, three. The fourth one is, do not be argumentative. Do not be argumentative. If you are argumentative, my sister in law always tells my brother, now, the people who have come are the people we should be listening to. Because my brother is very talkative. <laughs> he, my, 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 they are old now. So you say, Baba so and so, the people who have come are the people we should be listening to, to bless us. <laughs> she, she has told her twice in, in, when I visit. Um, she said, these are people who have come. We should be listening to them. Do not be argumentative. Learn the secret of listening. Learn the secret of listening. If you are argumentative, if I come to bring you a suggestion or an idea, I tell you I saw something somewhere, somewhere. Before I even finish, you already started arguing about it. Are you going to receive that blessing? Many people actually are cutting off their blessing by argument. They never even let you finish the message you are bringing them. They never wait for you to bring the report that, you have, that God has sent you for them. But as you listen and ask more questions, ask more questions and talk. Ask more questions. If you are talkative, that is good. But instead of saying, ask more. Because I don't want you, if you are talkative, to say, oh, that's bad. That's a gift. That's a gift. If you are talkative, that's a gift. As my wife would tell you. That's a gift. But ask more questions than, than trying to argue or to cut short. Oh, okay, go up there, go to me. Let me cut you short. There are people, actually, I have a colleague, we have worked together for about 20 years. I don't know whether you have had people who say, as you are speaking, say, Asha, <laughs> the, the, he, will, he will counter everything. He's actually a walking Wikipedia. Himself is a walking Wikipedia. You can, he's a walking Google. <laughs> but what I find about him is he's a one-sided Google. <laughs> Whenever you ask him a question, he will always have an answer, but the answer is always leaning towards a certain side. This person... misses out as we have conversation. Because if he could listen to me, maybe he would not be where he is. I'm not saying that I, I have a monopoly on wisdom. But I'm saying any person who is talking to you, like my son talked to me and told him you are stone-faced, he was passing wisdom to me. And I did argue with that. I actually went and asked myself, am I, maybe I, I, I really am stone-faced. And I started working on it. Last but not least, do not be aggressive. There has been a celebration of being aggressive. Especially if you come to the United States, that's you'd, when you would know the meaning of the word aggressive. People are aggressive. Don't confuse aggressive and having initiative. They are not one and the same. Jesus said, be as wise as a serpent but as gentle as a dove. I'm telling you, your gentleness will take you further than your aggressiveness. More people will allow you in if you're gentle than if you're aggressive. It might not look intuitive, but I want to suggest to you that more people will receive you if you're more gentle than aggressive. You see, everyone wants to be macho. Also, say, these are my rights. I know what I'm talking about. Can I see the manager? <laughs> Who is your supervisor? Now, now the, the messenger might help you. 
The person in the front of his office might take you very far if you're gentle. They might open the treasure of the organization to you. As I conclude, Paul prays for us and says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope that which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. I pray that your eyes, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you have been called. Those words are found in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 to 20. It is out of a closer walk with the Lord that your eyes of understanding will be enlightened and that your ears will be tuned to hear where God is telling you to go so that you can embrace your blessing. Amen? Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, because today we have received the call for January, for the window that is open for the year. You are calling us to enlarge to build capacity because indeed you have you want to bless us every one of us in this room you want to bless us you have no discrimination you have no favoritism you care for all of us you want to bless each one of us boy girl man and woman everybody you want to bless each one of us and you're calling us to prepare ourselves to connect with you to build capacity to receive, retain, and manage this blessing. You are calling us to move into this blessing by asking, knocking, and seeking. You are asking us to look at our own lives and see what is it that hinders, what is it that slows us down to go and move to where God has our blessing. Cause us, Lord, to stretch our feet, to stretch our hands, to receive those blessings you have for us. Cause us to see around us the sugar cane that's around us. The blessing that's around us. Cause us to know who we are. The children of the king. We thank you. And we praise you. I want to pray the same prayer that Paul prayed. That God may open the eyes of our understanding, the eyes of our heart, and our ears. Because if only we can see, if only we can hear, you would hear the Lord say, cast your net to this side. Maybe that's what you've been wanting to hear. Knock at this office. Applies to this school. Maybe that's what you've been here, wanting to hear. And my prayer is that your eyes and your ears of understanding will be opened. That you hear the Lord. And out of a closer walk with Him. There are those who are afraid of walking closer to the Lord. You think it's going to hurt you. But I want to say, I've never seen anybody who gave his life to Christ and got worse. Nobody's life has been made worse by giving his life to Christ. Nobody's life has been made worse by you having a closer walk with the Lord. Do not be afraid of having a closer walk with the Lord. You, it, you, you will only gain and nothing to lose. Do not be afraid to walk closer to the Lord. Even you who has been walking with Christ for many years, I want to encourage you today. Make one step more closer to the Lord. There is everything to gain and nothing to lose. Do not be afraid to come closer and closer to God because the eyes of your understanding will be opened and the ears of your understanding will be opened and you'll be able to enter God's rest. Amen? And as I pray this prayer, you want me to include you in this prayer, please keep your hand up. Lord, we want to pray these words that Paul said that our, the eyes of our heart may be enlightened. And that our ears may be able to hear where you say, cast your net to this side. If only we could hear your voice, Lord, everything that looks like a mountain would be so easy. Because we would just do at your word, the very word that you speak, 
will carry us to where we need to go. We thank you, Lord, this day for your word. And we pray that this word will be a source of reference for this year as we continue to thank you for the many blessings you have for us. And you will also help us to build the capacity to receive the blessing. You give us the strength in our feet to be able to move to where our blessings are and to stretch our hands to embrace that which you are giving us. We thank you, Lord, for you have spoken to us. In Jesus' name, amen.